everyone, I'm Captain Courageous, and I review old school modules and games to try to give them a fun and informative analysis. This week I'm reviewing Gazetteer 3, The Principalities of Galantry. This classic supplement was written by TSR Line editor Bruce Hurd and would serve as the template of what a D&D Gazetteer should contain going forward. Just a quick spoiler warning, if you would like to play in this, you might want to direct your DM here so that perhaps it might spark their interest, as despite the fact that this is a gaming supplement, there are some secrets of the setting that players should not be aware of. And still with me? Alright, let's begin. Principalities of Galantry was written in 1987 by TSR Line editor Bruce Hurd. Hurd got his start with TSR as a French translator, as he could read and write both languages fluently, in addition to Spanish, Portuguese, and a little German. During the mid to late 80s after Frank Menser had left TSR, it was Bruce Hurd that shaped the direction of the D&D game going forward. Most of the influential D&D modules of that period were either written by Hurd directly, co-wrote, or consulted by. As lead product manager on the Gazetteer series, it was his responsibility to weave together the rich tapestry of the known world into the cohesive and fascinating campaign setting it ultimately became. He also wrote a very popular series of articles for Dragon Magazine, Voyages of the Princess Ark, which covered the journeys of the crew of that skyship as it flies over the various lands of the world of Mystara. The series proved very popular and ran from Dragon Magazine issue 153 to 188 and ultimately was developed into a box set of its own, Champions of Mystara, Heroes of the Princess Ark, in 1993. Hurd decided to write this third supplement himself as he wanted to give an example of the types of things a D&D Gazetteer should contain for his freelance writers to go by. This entry in the line also changed the format from 64 pages to 96. Like other supplements of this line, there is some similarity to real world countries. The Principalities of Galantry takes its cultural cues from Eastern Europe, Ireland, France, Germany, and so on, really being a hodgepodge of influences and presents a firm example of what a nation ruled by magic users might be like. The more popular Dreams of the Red Wizard supplement frequently gets mentioned as TSR's prime setting of majocracy, but in my mind, this supplement did it far better. Its background history, culture, and game crunch but to understand what's going on in this setting, we really have to go all the way back to the first D&D campaign, Blackmoor. As I've mentioned before, the D&D Noon World and Dave Arneson's Blackmoor campaign are said to be the same world, though the time frame of the Gazetteers is actually 4,000 years later. In Dave Arneson's original campaign game, a spaceship, the F. SS Beagle crash lands in Blackmoor, setting off a bizarre chain of events, which I will not recount here entirely. Suffice to say, a crew member of the Beagle, Stephen Rockland, violated the non-interference protocol and along with several other crew members, mutinied against their captain. In the escape, their life pod was damaged and they crash landed in Loch Glumen, or Lake Glumi, where the Temple of the Frog was located. Using alien technology at his disposal, Stephen took over the sect and became known as St. Stephen. This series of events is actually covered in the classic module series DA1 to DA4, which marked a brief return of Dave Arneson to TSR in the mid-80s. As a bit of additional trivia, the Temple of the Frog Adventure was the first official D&D adventure in print and appeared in the original D&D supplement 2, Blackmore. In any event, centuries later, the nuclear engines catastrophically explode, altering the axial tilt of the planet. Blackmoor is destroyed, and the climate of the planet is drastically altered. This devastating event alters the geography and the future development of every species on the planet, and part of the fun of each gazetteer is seeing what interesting changes that event had on the culture covered in the supplement. In regards to Galantry, the effect is significant. In fact, Galantry would not exist were it not for the creation of the powerful artifact, the nucleus of the spheres that resides in a cavernous vault 10,000 feet below the great school of magic in Galantry City. 
This artifact is actually the nuclear reactor from the FSS Beagle, though now it has been greatly altered by the Immortals of the Sphere of Energy. Initially used by the Immortals of Energy as a means to make it easier for mortals to follow the path of immortality in the Sphere of Energy, Immortals from the other spheres could not let such a thing pass as it would create an imbalance, so they alter the reactor again, and now, unknown to anyone, including the mages of Galantry, using the nucleus of the spheres, slowly drains magic from Astara, ultimately to drain it completely, at which point the reactor will explode once again with devastating consequences. Now, for those not familiar with the master rules of Dungeons & Dragons, the cosmos is divided into five spheres of power, time, energy, thought, matter, and entropy. Each of these spheres have differing paths to immortality. For example, a character who has achieved sufficiently high level and successfully petitioned an immortal from the sphere of time could follow the path of the dynast. Each path must perform a quest, a trial, give testimony, and perform some monumental task in the cause of the sphere of power they are petitioning. In the case of the dynast, they must create a dynasty. The requirements for each path are different and covered in great detail in the Master's Rules and also the D&D Rules Cyclopedia. Thus, you can see why, if immortality to the sphere of energy were made easier, this would be a great problem for the other four spheres. There are detailed rules for the DM to keep track of the nucleus's use and a point system that determines what effects begin to take place in the world as its magic is slowly drained. The supplement has quite a bit of cool game crunch in regards to using the nucleus of the spheres. Galantrian nobles can use it to make their spell effects more powerful have longer durations and so on, plus there is a pretty large list of brand new spells that are dependent on access to the nucleus. There are some pretty detailed item creation rules as well. In addition to the item creation rules and the lists of new spells, there are seven secret crafts that wizards of the school of Galantry can learn. Alchemy, Dracology, Elementalism, Illusionism, Necromancy, Cryptomancy, and Witchcraft. These are very similar to the schools of magic in 2nd edition D&D or even the arcane traditions in 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. This is an extremely detailed 8 page section that reveals the special powers that mages of the circles can gain. Advancement in a craft comes in 5 stages or circles and gaining the abilities requires a certain number of days of study and a successful intelligence check but use of the ability is subject to percentile rolls. The chance of success is halved if the requisite number of experience points haven't been paid. This is not multi-classing. Essentially, earned experience is spent on gaining the new circle, interrupting regular level advancement. Once the cost is paid, the experience points are lost and regular level advancement continues. All of this power does not come without a price, however. Continued use of the Radiance can cause the body to wither and deform over time, and those Wizards of the Radiance of exceptionally high level eventually become grotesquely deformed. Galantry is broken up into ten principalities, and those are in turn ruled by ten noble houses, and this is the meat of the supplement, as each house is detailed. Of course, longtime D&D fans will recognize the lead house, Solaire, led by a teen D'Amberville, which connects back nicely with the Castle Amber setting. Some of the houses come from other worlds. For example, House D'Amberville comes from a world that is similar to medieval France. As I mentioned in my review of the Dawn of the Emperor's box set, certain factions in Galantry are actually descendants of settlers from the same world as the mages of the Empire of Alphacia. Though they were rival factions and arrived hundreds of years later. In addition to all of that, some houses are led by liches, vampires, or werewolves, giving the countryside an Eastern European aesthetic. Galantry City is extremely detailed and laid out section by section. The city takes on the character of a real world Venice with canals rather than streets, and passage through the city is primarily by gondola. 
Of course, the most important location in Galantry City is the Great School of Magic, and that too is mapped and laid out in excellent detail. Add to all of this is the political machinations and intrigue that makes the territory especially dangerous. Clerics are outlawed. The interworkings of alliances and enemies are provided, and of course the major NPC backgrounds and stats are provided to give it all character and breathe life into the setting. I found the NPC background section the most enjoyable to read through, and as is appropriate for such, many adventures suggest themselves. Prince Jaeger von Drachenfels, an accomplished battlefield commander and leader of the house Alban, he is known to hire adventurers to seek out monsters that dwell in the mountains that border his principality. He also secretly takes on a second identity, a dragon hunter named Urkiarth of Greys, and may join a party of adventurers. There is Prince Morfail Gorovich Wazlany, ruler of Baldavia, who is secretly a Nosferatu. The tragic stories and evil plots fill the pages of this supplement, and certainly any DM will find plenty of meat here to create an adventure or even a complete campaign. Bruce Hurd's talent as a writer and game designer is on full display, and the guidelines he sets up for his freelance writers is one of the main reasons the Gazetteer series is so cherished by old school and new school gamers alike. The supplement finishes things out by providing quite a few adventure hooks for a variety of levels and serves as a great start for any prospective DM trying to discern what type of adventures can be had here. The Principalities of Galantry is a phenomenal supplement that would be useful in any DM's library either as inspirational reading or as the template of a majocracy even if they never run a Mastaran campaign. The one downside to this massive tome is that it is missing an index. Later gazetteers would include them, but an, as an early entry in the series, its lack of such is problematic given the scope of the material. Fortunately, if you own the PDF, this isn't a total disaster as it is a searchable one. In fact, the PDF and a print-on-demand copy can be acquired from Drive-Thru RPG for just $7.00 and 66 cents, which is a phenomenal buy. eBay is not so kind with copies ranging from 30 to $60. The stunning cover art for this supplement is by Clyde Caldwell and interiors by Stephen Fabian. As I said in my previous reviews of the Gazetteer series, Fabian's art is really great at capturing the personality of the NPCs in the book and every such portrayal just drips with character. So let's take a look at the Principalities of Galantry on my D20 scale of style, presentation, and value. Style-wise, the format change in this entry greatly enhances its usefulness. The sense of culture is ever-present here, and its tone is never off-message. I'll rate this a 19. The presentation for the vast array of material is top-notch. It's not only easy to follow, but the history and characters make for genuine, entertaining, and fascinating reading. The imagination runs wild with the stories of the various houses and the adventure ideas just drip from the pages. Unfortunately, the lack of an index can make refinding certain passages a bit difficult, so I'm going to downgrade this to an 18. For value, the availability of this for print on demand makes for a great buy. Sadly, I don't particularly care for the way the wilderness map is broken and chopped up, and certainly prefer it when the map is kept together for a two-page splash view. The auction prices are a bit prohibitive as well, so I'll rate this a 17. That brings my overall rating of Principalities of Galantry to an 18. Very good. Thank you all so much for watching. As usual, I'd like to give a big shout out and thank you to all my patrons. If you enjoyed this review, please subscribe and click the little bell so you'll get updates when I add new content. Please give this video a like, comment, and share. Join the channel's Facebook page, RPG Reviews, and consider supporting the channel by becoming a patron yourself. Or alternatively, you can just send a tip through the PayPal tip jar link in the description. As always, my friends, may your D20 roll true and game on.